My specialism in particular uh, lies around insurance. And uh, what I'm going to discuss uh, this morning is an issue of really enormous contemporary significance. So this is the way in which insurance can and, and will respond to the kind of current COVID-19 outbreak and, and the effect which it has on, on economies uh, globally. Um, one of the things uh, that we need to do to understand really law at a kind of advanced level, working at a master's level, is to make sure that we understand the, the kind of business processes, the markets that we're talking about. It's, it's not just enough to kind of look at the case law. And so uh, kind of research led teaching that we will undertake will often uh, look to explain to you the kind of wider context in which the law and, and, and particular points of litigation arises. So uh, when we think about insurance and how it responds to catastrophic losses, we need to think about the nature of the losses and how this is different for insurance markets. So generally speaking, um, insurance works by what we call risk pooling. So that's bringing together lots of losses that are broadly speaking the same, but which are a technical phrase uncorrelated. So what that means is if we take something like uh, motor insurance, we don't know who will have a motor accident in any given year. But if we bring together 100,000 people and they're all insured with the same insurer and they all have roughly the same level of risk, it becomes reasonably predictable to work out um, on average how many claims there will be in that 100,000 people. So this is a, a mathematical process. It's, it's called the law of large numbers. It's not a, a human law, it's a, it's a mathematical law. So the more times that I run a risk, the more predictable the outcome becomes. So insurers can take in a certain amount of premium from each of the people, put that in a big pot of money, invest it, and be fairly confident uh, within certain bounds how much money they'll be paying out there'll be good years and there'll be bad years but the difference between the good year and the bad year will be relatively small so one of the great things that insurance does is to make the unpredictable reasonably predictable and insurance is incredibly effective in economies at helping to smooth out those kind of incidences of good and bad luck that, that happen across uh, uh, across societies and economies so how is COVID-19 different? How are pandemics, how are catastrophic losses different? Well, they're not uncorrelated. So uh, they are what we would call the opposite, a correlated loss. So uh, if we go back to my example of a motor insurance, the fact that someone has a car accident in Leeds doesn't make it more likely that someone else will have a car accident in London. The, the two losses are, risks are independent of each other. But pandemics don't work like that. The fact that someone has an outbreak of a highly infectious disease in Leeds makes it much more likely that there will be losses in London. So with a correlated loss, something like a, an infectious disease like COVID-19, we have a domino effect. The chance of a second loss is much higher because a first loss has occurred. And this means that the chance of a third loss is much higher and a fourth loss and so on. You get that domino effect. And so unlike normal kind of insurance products, normal kinds of risks that the markets are fairly comfortable with, so issues like car accidents or accidents at work or those kind of things that are independent risks, correlated loss looks very different because most years what you'll have is no loss at all. And you can go a very long time with no real losses at all. But then the bad year will be horrendously expensive, huge amounts of losses all flowing from each other. So the knock-on effect means that you end up either with very low levels of loss or very high. So the difference between the good year and the bad year is enormous, much, much greater than with the motor accident standard kind of risk. So this causes real problems for insurers. And generally speaking, insurers are happier with uncorrelated losses. That's normally what they seek to insure. That's much easier for them to calculate and to organize their business with. And this is demonstrated when I look at the standard clauses. Sorry, there uh, 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 we go. Um, okay, so generally speaking, businesses, although they buy business interruption insurance, so that's insurance to cover themselves against loss of profit, 
mostly they don't buy cover for these kind of correlated losses like pandemics for catastrophic losses. There are rare examples uh, uh, to the opposite. Uh, 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 so Wimbledon famously, I think this has now become the kind of known example, had bought um, every year for the last 17 years insurance against having to cancel its event because of the breakout of a disease just like COVID-19. And so we're told it's paid about 25 million in premium. And so that money is going out and for every other year, it's, it's not got anything back in return for that. But this year, it was able to cancel the uh, uh, competition and recoup a large amount of its lost profits. So we're told about 114 million because it had this insurance in place. Now, most organizations did not buy that bigger, wider, extended cover that Wimbledon had bought. So if you do the maths on this, Wimbledon were kind of, uh, in terms of premium to, to, to return, it was a kind of one in 80, roughly kind of risk. If, it, if, it, if the pandemic occurred, something like there's more than one in every 80 years, it was a good investment. Um, if it didn't occur within 80 years, then it was a bad investment. But it, it, it was happier knowing that it was covered uh, for this kind of risk. So most insurers do not offer the kind of thing that Wimbledon offered. Even if they offer it, most insureds don't buy it. What most insureds buy in terms of business interruption insurance is damage to insured property caused by some kind of physical harm. Okay, so uh, that can be seen in the kind of standard terms. Now, the contracts vary from insurer to insurer. So uh, what I've got here are some uh, examples of the kind of clauses that you would see in the market. And they have the kind of uh, common themes and trends that I, uh, that I identified uh, earlier on. So if we look on the left hand column for standard business interruption cover, this is the kind of insuring clause. So this is the kind of big promise that the underwriter makes to say, this is what we do. And of course, there will be a long document that follows on from this with caveats and limits and so on. But, but this is the kind of heartbeat, the center of the of the policy. So it says the company will indemnify the insured for gross profit as a result of interruption of or interference with the business carried on at the premises in consequence of damage to property. So that's the crucial bit. It's for losses to your profit in consequence of damage to property used by the insured. So in order to be able to recover at the moment for some kind of uh, uh, COVID-19 loss, you would need to prove under the standard policy that there was some kind of property damage. Now, this isn't an accident that this is here. Normally, property damage is the kind of thing that we would see as being uncorrelated. So if you have a fire at your restaurant in Lincoln, it doesn't make it more likely that there will be a fire at a restaurant in Bristol. If there is a tornado, it might hit a particular location, but it's not going to hit everywhere in the country all at the same time. So most of these kinds of losses that cause property damage are reasonably located in a small geographic area. Sometimes it might only be one or two properties, sometimes it might be 20, but it's not going to affect the whole of the country all at the same time. So insurers have deliberately designed this cover so that it didn't tend to pick up the, the kind of issues that hits everyone all at the same time. If you wanted that kind of extended cover, you had to go and buy additional policy or, or, or get an extension of your existing policy, and that would of course cost you more money. Okay, so the, the wider the cover you want, uh, the more expensive it will be. And here I have on my right hand column, the standard terms produced by the Association of British Insurers, so the, the trade body for the insurance industry, some kind of sample clauses. And these would need to be tweaked and amended for a particular uh, policy, but these are the kind of starting points. So it will cover you in addition to property damage for occurrence of a notifiable disease at the premises. It will cover you under B for the discovery of an organism at your premises, which is likely to result in a notifiable disease. So you find a virus in your particular restaurant or pub or hotel. It will cover you for the loss of profit caused by that. It will also cover you, and this is quite important in the current circumstances, for the occurrence within a defined geographic region. 
And here the individual parties would have to negotiate what they want that to be. So the first suggestion is either in the town or borough, so you would name it, so you would say within Southampton, and you would define that by uh, relation to maybe the local authority region. Or if, you, your, if your, uh, your restaurant is in the middle of the countryside, you don't really have a, a kind of neighbouring region, you could say, well, within a radius of 25 miles. But you would negotiate some kind of geographic limit. And then you would say, well, if there's a notifiable disease within that uh, uh, zone, within that region, then the insurer will pay out. But for your loss of profit, that is in a consequence of the occurrence of that notifiable disease. OK, so we'll need to show which kind of contract we have, which kind of policy we have. And we'll then need to try and work out what kind of losses will fall within this. Just because you have an insurance policy does not mean that your insurer is liable. You have to show as the insured that the particular event that occurred fell within the limits of the contractual promise. So there's some really interesting, genuinely interesting and important contractual questions going on. Okay, so if we think about the kind of things that are likely to get litigated, and to be clear, we know this is going to be litigated. The regulator, the Financial Conduct Authority, has announced that it will be bringing some test litigation. Uh, and I suspect within a, a, a matter of weeks, probably rather than months, we're going to see the courts uh, looking at exactly these kinds of issues and in some detail. And there, and there are billions of pounds of potential liabilities uh, uh, riding on the decision. So uh, within the standard cover, we saw that you had to show some sort of property damage. So let's imagine that we have a worker who's gone in, working in the kitchen and we can show that they had a coronavirus uh, and that that has been left in some way on a work surface. OK, so we have an infected premises. Is that damage to property? Now, your instinctive response might be no. No, this doesn't look like damage to property at all. Um, property's not been damaged. Well, and I think that's probably right. But there is there are cases where uh, asbestos dust has been treated as property damage. And there's also been discussion about whether certain types of nuclear radiation might constitute property damage. So some sort of contaminant might count. The general view, I think, is that a virus is not enough to count as property damage, but uh, that's a matter for the court. The other question would be, even if we can show this is property damage, what's the cost of remedying that? Well, how long would we have to be closed for? If we'd only have to close for 48 hours at a hotel or a restaurant while we can't clean the surface and make sure there was no active virus, you aren't going to be able to recover for you know, two months of lockdown costs because the property damage only caused two days worth of losses and you'll only be able to recover for those two days worth of losses. So that kind of discussion, what are the limits of cover and how much can we say the damage economic harm suffered was caused by the infection. That's likely to be really at the uh, heart of the uh, litigation, which we'll see in the court shortly. Where the insured has bought the wider extended cover, and said so this doesn't happen very often, this will be fairly rare cases, we'll then have questions about, well, was COVID-19 a notifiable disease? And those are some factual questions. It's the, it's the state, it's the authority, so in this case, Public Health England, that, that declares COVID-19 a, a, a notifiable disease. And from that point onwards, you might think you have cover. Now, I've seen some insurers say that it had to be a notifiable disease on the day you bought the policy, not at the day of the loss, so that notifiable diseases is fixed as a list. It's only those things that were notifiable, um, say, in November last year when you bought your one year policy. Uh, I think that must be wrong. The, the general approach in this kind of situation is to assume that these lists are dynamic so that something has to be notifiable disease at the time of the loss, not at the time the contract was made. But that's a matter fundamentally for uh, uh, the courts to engage in a process of contractual interpretation. OK, so what we have is a uh, potential uh, litigation hotspots uh, and the courts will be looking at the contract fundamentally to uh, answer these questions on the basis of uh, established principles of insurance contract law. But before we move on, we need to understand that insurance contracts are not just contracts. 
So they have a, a, a significant level of regulation, which, which overlays the contractual relationship. You can't just look at the contract terms, you also have to look at the codes of conduct and the rules uh, uh, that are made by the regulator, so that's the Financial Conduct Authority. It's also really important, and this is something we study in quite some detail at master's level, to understand that there are dispute uh, resolution systems beyond the courts. So the Financial Ombudsman Service, which was created in the early 2000s, decides disputes on insurance, mortgages and other kind of financial services areas on the basis of law and good practice. So even if the insurer is right in law, it doesn't have to pay this claim if it went to court, the ombudsman can still say, well, you're right in law, but I don't think it's good for the industry. It's not good practice to deny this claim. You should still nonetheless pay this claim. So the limits of the ombudsman's practice is also going to be very important in dealing with COVID-19 claims. It's not enough just to understand the, the kind of formal legal uh, issues.